Hi, happy Thursday to everyone here at Custody Matters. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about key questions for caring co-parents to support their kids. Uh, now, there's a, a lot of time, some of the things that I was answering on the threads this week was how do we tell our child the truth? Um, how about the other parent, especially when the other parent is not really doing anything to help themselves. They, they, you know, they're breaking their word, always breaking their word about when they're going to be there. They're, you know, they, they promise they're going to do this, and they promise they're going to do that, and then, then we're left with the child that's a child that's disappointed and discouraged, and um, it's just, it's a, it's a really frustrating thing to, to be, place to be, and yet we're supposed to uh, make sure that, that our child is going to see their other parent in the best of light. Why would we do that if, you know, if we don't really care about the ex, especially if our ex is somebody that we don't even like? Um, however, we've got to keep our heads in the right spot, all right, in realizing that whatever we say can and will hurt the child if uh, we say it with the intentions of, of frustration, malice, vengeance, aggravation, things like that. So a lot of times we can reframe things. It's not like, like um, by withholding the, the ugly truth about our ex that doesn't mean that we have to lie, okay? Some things that uh, sometimes people, they want to teach, they want to be able to be open and honest with the child, but they're, they don't, know any other way but to just, you know, blab their sins out to the child, and it will definitely hurt the child, for sure. So, uh, let's see, how to, it, it, when you think about it, there are certain things that are age appropriate, just in life, whether it's an intact family or a, a family where there's a divorce or separation, there's still certain age appropriate things that we share or we don't share with our child until they get a certain age. Like, you know, some everybody has their different age appropriate time that they're going to, to, to share with the child the, the details of, uh, uh, of sex and where babies come from. So uh, that's a perfect example of, you know, when you're a four-year-old or your five-year-old or six-year-old, ask a question and you don't want to lie to them and, you know, tell them how they came from the store or, you know, whatever. Um, you don't want to lie to them. Um, but it's, it's not the time to be completely, uh, give them all the details. It's just not appropriate. Um, another one is just, uh, let's, you know, some people like the fantasy of Santa Claus. That's a good one. Uh, when is, you know, are we, are we, that's a, that's a blatant mistruth when we tell even our three-year-old or four-year-old, you know, that about the tooth fairy and, and, uh, and Santa Claus. So how is it that we feel that it's okay to tell our four-year-old or five-year-old or, you know, whatever, however old, um, you know, why it is that their other their parent is, um, always breaking their promises, always late, why the lights get shut off, why it is that you're struggling financially, uh, why is it that they somehow it's okay to, to hear, for a child to hear what a, a loser their other parent is, and this is all the reasons why. But yet we want to shelter our child in fantasy of something that's like really not the truth. So, you know, it's, uh, a lot of times we, if we can shift it into a different context, we can really get, we can almost like dis realize when something is driven from emotion, emotion meaning, meaning bitterness, resentment, hurt, or, um, or whatever, and something that's really what's so. What's so is unemotional, this is the way it is, okay? Um, and that doesn't mean that, hey, hey mommy, why did the Lights get shut off. Well, you know, what, but what's really so is, is I didn't get my child support check. Now, that would be, uh, okay, so 
it may be a fact, but is it a fact that really that your child really needs to know? And if you were in an intact family and you you might have had one parent that was a, a, a bit more financially irresponsible than the other. We don't throw each other other under the bus because we don't want our child to experience have the experience of half of themselves being a loser. Okay, so it's something to keep um, keep our bearings. We always have to keep ourselves in check. And a lot of times, if you get we get an accountability partner, um, that really helps. And in an account Billy partner would be like a coach, not a counselor, a coach. So what's the difference? A counselor would, uh, and it's my view, I don't come from a mental health background, so it's just my personal view, is a counselor um, assesses and diagnoses and, uh, and comes up with, um, and wants and listens to a lot of your problems and, you know, and all of the, the conflict and stuff like that. And um, so it's almost like you, you know, they give you permission to emotionally dump. But, um, and sometimes it can be a good thing. You have a friend, a, a accountability partner that allows you to do your emotional dumping, but a coach doesn't let, let you sit in your shit, so to speak. You know, the, a coach would say, all right, I've heard it, and this does not serve you. So you've, I've heard you for 10 minutes doing this. We're going to set this aside. And now how are we going to be powerful such that you are not a, you are no longer the victim of this. You are going to be an overcomer of this. So it's very important to have a, to have somebody that you, that can call you out on your stuff that doesn't just let you wallow in it. Because now, now you've got two toxic people. You were toxic. Now you made somebody else toxic. And now you, you're having a, a toxic party, and that doesn't work, does not serve you at all. And, uh, and it doesn't help you to get yourself reframed such that you can be a powerful person to, to overcome your fear. Um, and a lot of times going through custody battles and stuff like that where you're, all of the what ifs start sh showing up in your, in your space. You know, oh, my gosh, what if, what if um, when I hand my child over to, to my other, my co-parent, what if they don't ever return my child? Oh my gosh, I would be devastated. Now you're in the emo an emotional swirl of the what if world. And the what if world um, doesn't exist. You really have to be clear that the what if world does not exist. And if they're gonna do, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. Okay, so, so thinking about a few weeks ago down in Miami where, or down in, um, South Florida, they, you know, some former student, a student that got expelled, came in and they, you know, shot everybody up. And about 20 people uh, were killed and huge, huge community was impacted. So that if I lived in the what if world of, oh my gosh, that's going to happen, I can't live that way. I cannot thrive like that. Did it happen? Yes, it did. Does it happen everywhere? No, it doesn't. There are many people, thousands of people, millions of people who've gone through school and never had that kind of trauma in their lives, and they uh, and yet they continue to go to school. So we cannot live in the what if world. It is not. A, it's not an empowering context, and it does not serve you or anyone else. We um, and, and and that's where what I do in working with with uh, individuals as a coach is get people grounded in what's real and get people from being in this fearful swirl of emotion and stuff like that. And does it, is it painful? Yes, it's very painful when a child uh, comes to you completely toxic and maybe even recruited to do what they can to make false allegations um, to police and guidance counselors and principals and teachers and stuff like that. I mean, they, um, it can be overwhelming and, um, you know, where you feel like you've just completely lost your, um, your relationship with your child that you'll never, ever get back. Um, but as long as you stay in the victim, victimized what-if world, um, the chances get, grow slimmer with, uh, with trying to get, a semblance of normalcy back.
Um, the other thing is, is you can, you, there has to be a space where you, there is a, there is a, a, a almost like a, a little compartment in your, your life that, that you are thriving at that is not, that is protected by like a bubble of, of this is my, my empowered part of my life while I'm going through all of this hell. I'm still, I am building, I'm going back to school, getting my education. I am, um, I am, I refuse to talk about all of this garbage during this, this segment of my, of my day. This, uh, I don't, I want to escape it. And you really do. You have to have an escape. And when you're going through this swirl of, of high contentious conflict and stuff like that, where, uh, because your ex, I mean, it, it just, it's not good for your head, not good for your life, um, can impact your employment, can truly uh, trigger things such that your child, um, or, or such that you're actually creating some of the, the negativity and um, going through, uh, you know, like when you bring all that baggage into your employment place, it's going to impact your, um, your effectiveness as an employee, which will impact your employment. Okay, so, so and then, okay, then who's to blame? So you um, try not to go down that slippery slope. But I'm kind of, I'm getting off topic. Um, I, my purpose for Thursday's Facebook Live is to talk about uh, key questions for caring co-parents to support their kids. So here's one. Uh, how can we make life better for our children after the divorce than it was before? Something to think about. How can we make life better for our children after the divorce? than it was before. So in my situation, and when I, um, I chose to end, end a marriage with the father of my children, it truly was uh, a shift in, this is not working. This is, this is um, life under one roof was not working. And I had to make a change. And it was truly, my intention was for the best, uh, so that my children could um, see something a little, a little bit more normal, more healthy, and stuff like that. Because I did not see that our family was in an, an healthy space. It was very much in an isolated kind of space of inauthenticity in, in regards to financial stability and um, and just in relationships. There was no, there were, there were no, no relationships were getting severed moment by moment. Uh, relationships with with um, parents and cousins and brothers and sisters and you know and friends that saw through the veil of, of inauthenticity. So that was my purpose. Um, did we go through hell for a bunch of years? Absolutely. Um, has it had an impact on to this day? Absolutely. You can't go through a five and a half year divorce and custody battle with all kinds of uh, false, you know, all kinds of allegations, or and there not be some ramifications, some some thing imprinted on the children, and um, some trauma that has happened. But um, a lot of it is doing is being grounded and, and, and getting yourself healthy. You've got to work. You got to really take care, do some self care as well. Okay, so uh, what can we do to boost their sense of security? self-esteem, well-being during the transitions ahead. Um, part of it is, is just not getting involved in, in um, battles and you know, like power struggles and stuff like that in front of the children. Um, having a way, a lot of times, a lot of times people will resort to different kinds of coping mechanisms when they're dealing with uh, um, with this, with this, I mean, it's, it's very predictable statistically that to have when when you're going through the divorce, a lot of times um, people throw themselves into a relationship, another relationship for comfort. They uh, resort to alcohol, uh, sometimes uh, uh, drugs, um, just risky lifestyles and things like that. Is it a permanent switch? Probably not. It's a. It's kind of a. It's a. It's releasing that pressure valve 
trying to deal with things, things that are very emotionally overwhelming. They just can't take it anymore. So if you, um, a lot of times it's easy for us to, to look at the other co-parent as you're going through all of this and like, wow, you know, they're coming out alcoholic and they're, you know, a drug addict and stuff. And I'm not saying that those things are really great as far as the, if it was a forever future, uh, like a whole brand new, like permanent way of being. But a lot of it is as long as they're not doing it in front of the children and um, that would, you know, that would constitute neglectfulness and, and things like that, then um, sometimes you just got to have that, let it, let it take its course. Um, think about it with teenagers. When, and we have teenagers, they go through the rebellion phase and stuff like that, and, and we just, we're going to lose our mind. We're trying, we are trying to get, we realize this, this creature is not the same person that I had when I was five years old. And a lot of it is teenagers go through that, blah, that phase of trying to, 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 to rebel. Uh, stretch their wings and, and and all that, and we know that if we can just somehow ride the tide, and once we get on the other side, then it, things will be smooth. It's um you know instilling once if you planted good seeds when they were young, they will not depart from it. They'll get wild, but they will come back. And and many times uh, a co-parent kind of goes through that similar kind of whatever, letting their hair down and, and stuff that and it just um, so how can we get that to be a shortened phase into some some normalcy part of it is grounding ourselves doing some self care and making sure that we're going down the right path okay so uh will our children respect us when they're adults for the way we handle the divorce that's something to really ask ourselves is that our choices that we make going through the divorce they will remember it they will remember the divorce and divorce is something that's very significantly um it's, it's a it's a dividing it's a it's a moment in time um almost like a mile milestone in time so a lot of times the children will even their language will change and say well you know before the divorce it was like this and then boom the divorce and then after the divorce it was like this they really use that as a mile marker to to as a major shift in the, in their whole life so that being said, how are we going to help them transition in going in through that? Um, and a lot of it is, uh, you know, trying to live how you're going to be from this point forward. And and uh, even when there's no agreement on the other side with another co-parent on how how things should be, you really need to be the big person. Since um, more than likely, your ex, your co-parent is not in the same group as this, so I'm speaking to you. You be the one. Be the one that takes the high road. Be the one that is the long-suffering person that says, you know what, um, the child support has nothing to do with visitation time. You, you know, you don't have, you don't, you're not paying child support, then you're not paying child support. That's something we're going to handle completely different in holding you accountable to that. We're not going to hold the child hostage to, uh, the child cannot spend time with you because because you didn't pay child support. That's like apples and blue. blue. Doesn't even relate. The two, the two are completely separate. And yet we, we merge the two as if one has anything to do with the other. So just always remember that the chi it's the child's rights. The child has a right to have access to their parents. It's not the parents' rights to have access to their child. And yet we, uh, a lot of times, because the parent is the voice for the child, we speak that way. But really, it's the child's right. Because the ch child has 50% DNA of a mom, 50% DNA of a dad. They have a right, as much a right to spend time with mom as they have with dad. Unless, of course, there was like legitimate abuse, neglect that's been, um, you know, taken, uh, taken through the criminal courts and, and so forth and so on. 
All right, let's see, another one. Can you provide the best? Okay. Um, am I burdening my children? By the way, I've gotten, I, I picked, uh, I pulled this off of Huffington Post, and I believe it was, let me see. Raza Sadaka, uh, her blog. Let's see here. How is the best, uh, how can we best support our children and minimize the physical, emotional, spiritual damage elicited on, upon them as a result of our divorce? Um, you know, best thing is, is to keep them out of the adult business. Think about how you, how you manage things while you were in an intact family. Um, if you were yelling each other, at each other and arguing in front of the child during during a, when when your family was intact, you're definitely going to do it when you have no loyalty to each other because you're no longer together. But was it healthy before? No, it wasn't healthy to be arguing in front of the children before. And if you were the type of couple that kept things out of you know behind closed doors, any conflicts that you have behind closed doors, then that's how it should remain, um, is between adults. A lot of times we adultify our children. Once they become the, uh, once we divorce and we have no more allegiance to the other, the other parent, we, we will actually, we won't even realize that we're like hiding this agenda from our own selves. We're just like, you know, I'm letting my child have the freedom to choose. You know, and, and they go to the parent. So here's the scenario. Thanksgiving. Aunt so-and-so flew all the way across the country to, um, to spend, to come and see her family and stuff like that. And, and, but yet, unfortunately, the child, it's not that parent's Thanksgiving. But the thing is, is aunt so-and-so was very close to that child. So the parent, so then there's, then there's this like tug of war, this power struggle between the parents. So, the child, so one of the parents says, well, you know what, honey, which, which home would you like to, choose to spend Thanksgiving? Would you like to spend it with me, which I'm entitled to have you for Thanksgiving, or would you like to spend it with your other co-parent when it's not their time, but you know, so-and-so is there to choose? That's not a very empowering um, Context for being able to choose. It puts the child on the spot, makes the child. Oh, so, so the child's not freely choosing to uh, go with one parent or the other. The, the child is sitting there thinking, hmm, okay, which parent am I going to piss off? Which parent am I going to, or which one I'm going to hurt? Which, you know, am I going to get in trouble if I'm like, so their, their considerations are. Making somebody a parent angry, which goes bad for them, uh, hurting a parent, which you know, it just teaches the the you know, it's just really all about all um, like the wrong context, and then it also teaches the child over time that they don't uh, that they get to choose that they're the boss. Well, you know, if you if you've been doing this, you're parentifying the the adult the child since they were you know five or six guaranteed when they hit about 14 and they are tired of your home rules they will you know they're they may not have the maturity to make decisions but you've been allowing them all along to be the boss so um good luck with that with the teenaging years and um and trying to to real wrangle them in try to get them you know, shorten that leash because it's just not going to happen and um, it won't go well for you. Plus, it just, it sets things up. The thing is, is if you don't, if you're teaching the child to not respect the other parent, you're all, so it's, you're not just teaching the child to, teach, to not respect the other parent. You're teaching the child that it, it's okay to disrespect anybody in authority, teachers, principals, bosses, you're, so you're setting them up for failure in the future if you're not teaching them to, to, to somehow honor the other parent just because the parent, the, the, the parent may be complete loser in your mind and, and uh, you may have all kinds of evidence to 
prove that they were they're a complete loser. But nevertheless, teaching the child that a, a parent is not to be respected just because they, you know, um, they let you down can really set that child up for failure as an adult. And ultimately, and my kids hated me when I said this, I would say to my children, I said, you know, I am raising future adults, not adult children. Um, ultimately, I want to work myself out of the job, not have to constantly like enable them until they're, you know, 50 years old or whatever, you know, or until somebody else takes over the role as, as being parent to them, which would be a spouse or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm raising future adults. And what kind of adult would I want a successful skill? Skills and tools and, and everything that would a parent have, you know, an adult have uh, or need that I need to make sure that they have been taught. So, um, see, see, here's another one. Would I? How can we show our love and compassion for children as they move through challenges they did not ask for or create? You know, um, a lot of times we don't have the answers and, and don't make up that we have the answers you can't just fabricate oh you know like uh, when the child asks us questions and we really do not know the answers um, um you know why does why does daddy don't call, why didn't daddy call me um, um you know he, why did we miss visitation i mean why this why that and you, see, and you can just be one thing you can do as far as being honest is say okay, well honey i i just don't know and I know, and you can speak of what you do know. What you do know is that the other parent loves the child with all their heart. Um, and yet, a lot of times when we love people, you know, they, they, they still have their issues. Uh, or, and they love you, they still have their issues. You know, maybe, um, so you can speak about, speak of what you do know, which is that you, Love, they love you. They love the child. Encourage them to make sure that they know that um, that the child is loved by both parents. Um, what else? The children going through just uh, do not bring up adult matters to the child. Because think about it: if the child, okay, so so you your lights get shut off, and you were really depending on the child support. And that was what you had in your budget, such that um, you could have phone, phone, electric, and whatever, whatever, you know. The fact is, is being, you, you've got to take 100% responsibility for all of your bills. Um, despite, um, I mean, that uh, monies haven't come in and, and not throw blame on someone else, especially if it's throwing, the, throwing them under the bus to your child. Because your child, ultimately, your child just wants security. They want to feel that, that they'll always have a place to sleep at night, that they'll always have food in their stomach, that they all, they feel an incredible, like a sense of security and love, okay? That, and uh, they don't need to know, like, is their security gone, like really, if the lights get shut off for a day or two? No, they haven't lost their security. But if you have, you've been part of telling them why the lights got shut off, um, that will serve more to take their security away than going a night or two without power. Um, so just, you know, manage, your, manage the words that come out of your mouth because that has the, the biggest impact on, on the child. Um, let's see. Do, do I want, want to rob my children of their childhood because of my divorce? I don't think that, um, you know, I've, I've not gone through all of these questions. It's sort of like I'm on the fly here. Do I want to rob my children of their childhood because of my divorce? You do not have to. You do not have to rob your ch children of their childhood because of their divorce. That 
um, again, is apples and blue. They, they are going to have the childhood that they're going to have. How are you going to impact it? Now, it's not necessarily about the divorce. It's about how, what kind of choices are you going to make for your child from this point forward? Are, what are you going to allow them? Like in my situation, I would, it was no longer acceptable to have my ch children or to, to be in uh, the situation that, that I was in. And, um, and I had to make a change. And my, my purpose for changing it was to improve the stability of my life and my children's lives. Little did I know that, that all hell would break loose uh, by that choice. So then at that point, I had to take it from that point forward to create something uh, moment by moment. But, and uh, really rely on people that didn't just let me sit in it and stew in it and just and let me do a ton of emotional dumping. Did I, I need people to emotionally dump to? Yes, I did. Uh, however, I, there was something inside of me that knew that, that I could only do a little bit of that, and then I had to set it aside because that didn't serve me to be continually in that swamp of, of emotional vomit. And uh, I had to like say, okay, all right, I'm not a victim. Um, I'm going to move forward and do this and this and this so that I can build my life. Um, so uh, let's see here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna not I'm gonna continue on that article because I there's some things in there I thought it wasn't the, the best article I could have selected for um, helping you. That's, that's my goal is to really kind of go through, through uh, poll articles, maybe even and, and try to give you a little bit of insight, basically from from my background and my experiences, not only my, my own personal uh, story, but also through the, the path that I've taken. Like, I mean, I really have to, to acknowledge that uh, I, I do what I do um, because of the conflict I went through. It, it kind of catapulted me into family advocacy. So I, uh, for that, I acknowledge my ex for uh, creating that for me. So because I knew that little did I know that I'd be able to touch the light of different people like yourselves in, in the process. So that I am grateful. All right, just realize the time. It's almost 33 minutes into this broadcast. And um, I hope that this, that you find this of service to you and beneficial to you. Um, and I will see you, um, see you in the blog. Have a good weekend.